We'll make your way over to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus the 15th chapter. We continue our, our look at the book of Exodus knowing that it's not Genesis and knowing it's not Deuteronomy. It uh, continues the story. And so far we have gotten the children of Israel uh, by the mighty hand of the Lord out of Egypt and away from at the end of Exodus 14, away from the pursuit of Pharaoh. Uh, that's where we start at. If you found Exodus 15, one, say amen. amen. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armies has been cast into the sea. His chosen captains also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them, and they sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O God, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemies in pieces. And in your greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You have sent forth your wrath, and it has consumed them like, a, like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were, to get, uh, were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap, and the depths congealed in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, but my desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, and the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty water. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fear and praise and doing, fearful in praise and wonder doing? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows them. You, in your mercy, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come to you this night, Lord, and we ask your blessing on the reading of your word. We ask your blessing on those who are with us tonight, Lord, and present, and those who will see us uh, on our YouTube channel and on our webpage, Lord, we ask you to bless those who are not able to make it, Lord, or because maybe they're vacationing or maybe they're still uh, concerned about uh, the, the situation that we find ourselves in. But, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, as they hear the sound of your word, Lord, may they respond mightily to one who deserves honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Having seen uh, this great work what the Lord had done in Israel, a great fear rises among the people of the Lord. Remember, the whole idea here is God was going to have a relationship. They were going to experience God. Whether you were Israelite or whether you were Egyptian, you were going to experience God. The Egyptian experience was that He had overthrown them and they were devastated. The Israelite experience was that they were elated at the mighty, complete victory that God had won for them. And this causes them to sin. Uh, and so much so that Moses or his sister Miriam or the women, one or the other, look to verse 20. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Moses, a uh, sister of Aaron, took the tremble in her hand. And all the women out after her with trembles and with dancing. And Miriam answered them, right here, the song is sung, and now Miriam is caught up with the dancing and trembling, and the women are dancing and with the timbrels, and they sing, Sing to the Lord, for He is glorious, the horse and rider He is thrown into the sea. You can see instantly that this worship and praise has affected the whole entire congregation. It is nothing like seeing God do His work. It gets folks excited. And the experience that they had as a group, some uh, anywhere from 600,000 to 2 million, estimates vary that wide, folks saw in hot pursuit death coming their way. Remember, they had no idea that Pharaoh just wanted to come get them back into slavery. 
Uh, again, that's why he sends out his horses, uh, chariots, his fascist chariots. That's why they have the captains, these leaders, these folks who can make decisions on them. That's why his horses are involved. He's trying to get around and in front of them and cause them to halt and lead them back into captivity so that uh, the devastation economically that was coming because they had moved out uh, would not affect Egypt. So, but they thought they were going to die. And some of them may have died in all of that. But they see a complete victory happen. And Moses begins to sing. Now our songs, whether in our hymn book or whether they're in our Bible, right? We, they must be important. We have a song here. We have a whole book dedicated to songs. And we even have songs of Solomon. So we have plenty of songs, but they have to be theologically correct. So Moses is going to be theologically correct. Now not everything you sing in a hymn book is theologically correct. Not everything you hear on that, uh, that they sing uh, on the radio, on the popular channels, now it makes a good tune, you can dance to it, but it's not always theologically correct. So whether we pick out our songs and our hymn books, or we choose to listen to our, our spiritual music on the radio, uh, are we teaching, or we're pastoring, or we're uh, sharing the gospel, we want to be theological, that is, have God thoughts and be Christ-centered and, and Bible-centered on what's going on. So here Moses begins in his experience with God to lay out in worship his understanding of God and his people understanding of God. He says, I will sing to the Lord. Well, okay, I'm going to lift up my voice to Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. For, you know, here it is, I'm going to do this, and this is the reason why I'm going to do it. He has triumphed gloriously. Not just triumphed a little bit, but triumphed over and above what was ever asked, thought, or imagined. Remember, that's how God is. That's biblically sound. Remember, the word glory means heavy, right? So when we say God deserves glory, it is that God deserves heavy thought and, and heavy concentration and, 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 and serious understanding. So he triumphs gloriously. Heavy is his victory. So, and the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. All the power and all the strength, the lightning capability of the Pharaoh's army, that thing that was most dreaded, especially those chariots. They were something in chariot warfare. They were a superpower back in that day, and how they got to be superpower uh, was not that they had an atomic bomb, but they knew how to use those chariots and those drivers and how all of that was, that thing that was their strength was dealt with. And what happens because of what God has done? Watch this, three S's. The Lord is my strength, right? So, biblically understanding this, this is who God is. He is the nation of Israel's strength. He is the believer's strength. He is the one who gives the strength. He is the source of that strength. Again, talking about from this morning, if we have the ability to get up in the morning, we have the ability to go to our job, or we have the ability to do what we want to do tomorrow, and we have the means by which to do it, whether it may be changing the oil in our lawnmowers or, or getting the dishes out of the dishwasher or putting them in with dishwashing soap or however that works out. Uh, the strength that we have all comes from God. He is our strength. That's why in the middle of the, the worst circumstances, we don't have to rely on ourselves, right? Moses and the Israelites had proven that they had no ability to affect the outcome as far as as Pharaoh's pursuit was concerned, the only strength that they had was to cry out to the Lord. And in that, God's answer was mighty and powerful and heavy. Heavy was his triumph over them. So the Lord becomes their strength, no longer depending. Now, they don't last long, but hey, don't feel bad about them. Remember, we're to look to them as examples. We often don't last long ourselves, right? We hardly ever recognize God as our source or our resource or our strength unless we're in dire need. And then when we get 
out of the trouble that we're in, either uh, through hook or crook or his salvation, however that works out, we often forget that he's our strength and we owe him anything. So don't feel bad for them. Feel bad for us that we forget this lesson that has gloriously played out here in, in these previous chapters leading up to uh, chapter 15. So the Lord is my strength and my song. Well, what would happen when we sing a song? Well, he is the one who is worthy of our, our, our poetry, worthy of our attention, worthy of our affection. That's how that works out. You know, there have been a lot of songs dedicated to a lot of women over this year, over this, over this lifetime that I've had. Charlene, you know, you're the one, the mother of God, you know, that one. And, and then what did uh, John Anderson, play? El, not Elvira, but what was the other one? Uh, eyes that look like it. that is oh, Elvira. The old, old the old boy sung that one, Elvira, and then they sit on the front porch in the swing, just a swing. That's John now what's that name? Just a swing. Just a swing, and who's the girl? Little Charlotte, right? There's been plenty of we, we've had plenty of people, and, and forgive my 80s and 70s. Forgive it. That's that's where I'm locked in at, baby. And I'm in that. There have been plenty of songs dedicated to love interest. Here, Moses experienced, the Israelites experienced with God, has caused them to begin to understand that this God is worthy of their love and adoration and should be a focal point of their poetry and their literary prowess, such as it did, thinking that this is in its infancy and thinking that this is the first time we realize that anybody sung a song to God. Right here, that we have recorded. God's become the center of their attention. But not only He's the strength and He's become their song, their focus, He's their source and now, He's their focus, but He's also become my salvation. Again, in the very strictest, earliest sense of salvation, they want a military victory. Now, we have the whole Bible change the idea from a physical victory to a spiritual victory as far as salvation is concerned. But here we see that God's able to accomplish exactly what He said He would do. He said that He would get them out, and He did. It didn't always look like they were going to go out. Sometimes it looked like uh, it was going to get worse before it got better. But ultimately, God became their salvation. So who is going to complete us? Who's going to strengthen us? Who are we going to put attention to? It's all going to be God. This is their realization of who He is. And He is what? Now He's claimed to be my God. And I will praise Him personally. I, I'm going to give up part of my time, part of my life to this. My Father's God, right? He's been here around for a long time. And He's proved Himself to my Father. And I will exalt him because he's proved himself to, to me. By the way, you can think that a lot. You know, I'm, I'm becoming a grandfather. Some others are becoming grandfathers. Some have become grandfathers and grandmothers. And the same God who kept you, bless his name, is going to be able to keep, keep that generation coming up. That's what it means to be from everlasting to everlasting. You don't have to worry about it. You put those children right in the hand of God and you watch them. You train them up in the way they should go and when they are old they won't depart from it. Why is that? Because that's a promise from Him who's from everlasting to everlasting, who keeps His word. The Lord is a man of war. Now again, that word Lord there is the word Yahweh or, or Jehovah and it's the covenant name of God. So his covenant God is a man of war. It's the same idea as we call him Jehovah Shabbat, or the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of armies. They begin to realize that. We'll see it over. Joshua talks about him being the Lord of hosts. We'll see the whole idea, the armies of heaven, all of these things. We'll see them played out over and over again in the Bible. But we start the idea of him being a man of war here, and this is part of his character. Who's going to fight for you? Well, all-time champion of the world. 
He'll fight for you. That's what he does. Who is he? The Lord is his name. Then they encapsulate what happened. There is Chero, the chariots in his army. He is cast in the sea. His chosen captains, those leaders who, who should have been able to outfox and outsmart and outstrategize everything that was going on. Again, chosen captains, these were leaders who could make individual decisions of their individual chariot, right? Those people who could have said, you know what? It's not a good idea for us to go down in there just because they told us to go in there, right? These are people who say, well, you know, maybe we need to have a few people reserved in case they come back out, <laughs> you know. Something. These people were sucked right in the middle. These people who could have made a difference in battle. These people also were drowned in the sea. And the depths have covered them. Think about this. The idea here of the depths covering is that there was a whirlpool action. And they sank to the bottom like a stone. We'll find them at. Your right hand, O oh Lord, has become... Glorious in power, right? We remember the right hand is a hand of power, and and, and he's shown himself to be powerful. And and looking at what he's done, the Israelites, Moses, they see that there's glorious, power. not just a little bit of power, but glorious, heavy, weighty power in his hands. Again, this is God who changes not. This is God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still has that kind of power in his hands. Uh, your right hand, O oh Lord, has dashed the enemy to pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. Here were those who were going to uh, have something to say to you and somebody who was going to rebel against you, somebody who was going to be able to stand up against you, and, and you without much effort at all have overthrown them. We'll see this whole thing play out again when? Book of Revelation. World armies are going to gather together. They're going to stand mightily with all the mighty weapons and and shake their fist and hurl their insults and all that stuff, and it will be no more problem for him to get rid of all the world's army and all of its technological advances as it was for Moses and Pharaoh. There's nothing that he won't be able to do with that. Uh, you send forth your lap. You consume them like stubble. And the idea there idea you need to think about is more like a bubble. It's a bunch of gurgling going on. Okay, gurgling is the word we want to use there. So you can just hear like them going down the drain in the whirlpool. And boom, 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 boom. That idea. And with the blast of your nostrils. Now they're, they're you know, God's spirit, but they're, they're giving him hands. You know, this is how they convey what they're doing. And, and now a blast of his nostrils, talking about the east wind. You know, they're doing that and... Uh, flood uh, stood upright like a heap or, or like a wall, and the depths congealed or becomes firm at the heart of the sea. The enemy says, this is what I'll do. I'll pursue. I'll overtake. I'll divide the spoil. My desires shall be satisfied. I'll draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. I've got all this under control. And you blew your wind, and the sea covered them, and they sank like lead, stone, lead. Stone is a natural heavy object. Lead is something man has done for himself, or at least extracted and, and, and purified in the mighty waters. Either way, it's like putting a, a weight on the end of your fishing line. No way to go but down. And he said, now watch this. This is interesting. And then we'll need to finish up. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Now, at this point, the Hebrews are not monotheistic. They don't have that one God mentality. They don't really learn anything about having a one God mentality until Exodus 20 when he begins to give the Ten Commandments. Here, remember, God himself said, I'll destroy the gods of Egypt. He's just one of many gods. But here's the idea about this for them is beginning to form that though they not, may not be monotheistic right now, right? And we are monotheistic. We don't worship a bunch of gods. We worship God the Father and, uh, you know, and His different personifications there, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Three gods, three in one, or one in three, however you want to do that, the triune godhood. Uh, 
Uh, that's who we worship. Here, they may not have that same idea, but they're beginning to dawn on them that the God that took them out of Egypt is unlike any other God. In my Bible, it's a little g. It's like, unlike any other item, unlike any other thing, it's monolatry. I didn't say it right. It's M-O-N-L-A-R-T-Y. It's like idolatry, but it's monology. Uh, they begin to understand that, that this God they worship is above all. Pretty soon they'll realize that there is no other God but Him. But here at least they're beginning to think that, that this God needs to be elevated above everything else they've encountered. There were hundreds of gods in Egypt. Generation after generation of Hebrew watched the Egyptians worship them. They may have even fell down for a few ceremonies themselves, but they're beginning to understand that whatever was there to hold them back, whatever he come up again, those ten plagues uh, wiped out and, and uh, took care of anything like that. Uh, who is like your your glorious in, uh, your glorious in holiness, fear? and praises and doing wonders. You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallow them up, right? They just disappear. You in your might have led forth uh, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. Who got us out of there, right? It wasn't Moses. You did it yourself. You redeemed them. You said you would redeem them. You redeemed them. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. You've done all this stuff. These next verses here talk about uh, what's going to happen in the promised land. We followed you out of Egypt, now we're going to follow you into the promised land. It talks about uh, the people will hear and, and be afraid and anguish will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away before you. And just think about this. If they have not messed this up and had to walk 40 years, if they would have went with this right here, they would have marched right in to the promised land and been able to accomplish this 40 years earlier than what they had to do. If they just remembered this is the God they serve. By the way, if you remember this is the God you serve, you may not have to walk around in the wilderness yourself. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as stone to your people pass over, O Lord, to your people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for you, for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went out with his chariots and the horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. <coughs> so, him being identified as their strength, their source, their song, their focus, their salvation, their completeness, this is the God that we need to remember. And this is the God that they'll encounter again and again so they finally get it right and get off into the promised land some 40 years down the road. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. May we worship you as our strength and our song. Understand that you have completed our redemption and have saved us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we will run up against nothing that will cause our heart to faint, but cause our our minds to remember uh, exactly who you are, Lord, and to be still and know that you're Lord. Lord, bless us as we go forward tonight. In Jesus' name I pray.